Hello, everyone. Uh, whoops, I didn't realise I've deafened you. Um, the favourite site of any session presenter has to be a busy and jostling hall, so I'm good to be relieved, and thank you so much for coming along. Very much looking forward to hearing your input uh, once we get the session underway. A uh, brief introduction of myself. Uh, I'm Anne McElvoy. I'm public policy editor of The Economist newspaper, and I also broadcast for the BBC uh, and present some radio and television programmes. But more importantly, our illustrious panel. I would like to give you a brief introduction from them, and then they're going to just tell us a little bit about themselves and this subject, which for today is our open forum, Faith and Gender Equality, Mind the Gap. A rather ominous injunction there. But I think this subject is one of the most fascinating, flexible, and wide-reaching ones that you could discuss anywhere uh, here at Davos because it touches on so many of the concerns that have to unite us all, whether we're believers or not, or just in that awkward bit in the middle where faith comes and goes like a badly received radio station. I do think that one of the reasons for talking about this is I heard one of the contributors saying in another session that in the wake of the financial crash, the search was now for values and not just for value. And I think that also means that issues like women, faiths, really, in a sense, how much do these things coexist happily? How do they work with progress, with technology, and with the challenges of the world around us are just becoming more pressing? In many ways, this debate has often been formed as a bit of a tension that faiths are holding women back, that they are, in a non-political sense, small c conservative. But is that necessarily true? That's a challenge I would like to throw out to the panel. But also, can, when we consider the you know, numbers of women in the world at over half of the population, the incredibly important role that women play in the social and economic welfare and development of their countries, that also gives us some food for thought. So let me tell you a bit about who is going to be discussing that with you today. Next to me, my right, your left, is Dermot Martin. He's Archbishop of Dublin in Ireland, and you can probably tell that because he's got the dog collar on, and he, his job is exactly what it says on the tin. Uh, next to Dermot is Ozala Ashraf Nemeth. She is Director of the Youth and Women Leadership Centre in the UK. During the Taliban regime, she uh, was working in Afghanistan for health and education programs for women and girls. And if that isn't really putting your beliefs on the line, I don't know what is. Uh, we have Chris Seipel sitting at my far left, your right, president of the Institute for Global Engagement in the USA, one of the major organizations really dealing with dialogue between the faiths, but also dialogues with governments. And he does speak very often, uh, and I think very interesting, on the relationship between religion and realpolitik. Chris, I might be putting that to the test with you in a little while. Uh, next to Chris is Karmit Fluk, who is governor of the Central Bank of Israel. So she really does have to live not only in the realm of a, a country with different faiths and some divisions, but also the real politic and the real economics of what must be one of the toughest jobs in the game. And to my far right, your left, Beth Brook, Global Vice Chairman, Public Policy, Ernst & Young. Uh, Beth also has a, in, a number of very important hats in terms of promoting women, women's empowerment, business leadership among women, and she has been named to the Forbes 100 Most Powerful Women list no less than five times, so she must be getting something right. Panel, your thoughts. Dermot, it seems fair to put you on the spot as a, uh, a, a man of God. What does this subject, faith and gender equality, what has it meant to you personally and professionally in your life? Currently, I'm the uh, Catholic Archbishop of Dublin. Earlier, I spent uh, most of my life working in questions of international development from the Vatican House and traveled uh, much of the world. Um, the first thing is today that I encounter every day a lot of hurt in the women in my church. Um, many parents will say to me, um, there's no future for my daughters in your church. They don't feel they're welcome. Um, 
and I think this is being, uh, is being repeated. Pope Francis sent out a questionnaire to every diocese, every individual church around the world, asking them questions about this and about marriage and the family. And the responses coming in are very clear that there's a, a great hurt and, um, and upset and a feeling of not being included among particularly young women. That, that, contra that goes then, when I go back to my earlier experience traveling around the world, I found that the Catholic Church and other churches have been in the leadership in education of women mm. uh, in, in developing countries, providing education for girls in countries where that wasn't normally accepted uh, and when, where actually countercultural. So why is it that you've got these, these and this is why I asked myself, uh, the, the, this tension between what's felt in my, and in particularly in, in Western societies, on the other hand, this church and other churches uh, and other, other faith groups who've done so much in educating women and uh, empowering women to take their place. That's a classic case of mind the gap, isn't it, where you have two <laughs> contradictory things going on at once. Well, I'm sure we'd, we'd like to dig into that a bit later. Ozala, uh, t tell me, you've worked in your native country in Afghanistan with women and girls, where the faith context is particularly difficult. How has that been for you? Uh, well, I may start by saying that I started my work uh, as an activist for women's rights and particularly for girls' education uh, during the late 90s, particularly during a, tal a time that the Taliban, the regime that was uh, trying to portray themselves as the true representatives of the Islamic values, and they had set up a government that they considered themselves, not any other person, but themselves were called, calling it a Sharia-based government. I started my activism as a conscious Muslim under such a circumstances where we had an apparent a system that was trying to link themselves directly to the religion and to people's faith. But there I was, a Muslim, born to a Muslim family, and learned a different type of Islam. And I have decided to work as an activist trying to provide education for girls within that system. So I was basically working in a clandestine situation, underground, and trying to create home-based classes for girls who could get educa educated. So in a way, in a parent, you, uh, I think faith or religion is definitely playing a role in, in all our lives, particularly in the lives of people who are living in societies that one religion is majority or absolute majority, which is the case in Afghanistan. And throughout my life and my work, I can say that I have always uh, 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 been faced with situations where I was challenged and my, my, my own religious uh, beliefs were questioned by radical forces and by conservative forces trying to say, huh, when you talk about women's rights, you are not representing Islam. And I have always, in, together with my colleagues, confronted that idea in trying to give direct references from what the religion says about women's rights, about respect that uh, the faith and religion is, uh, is paying to, uh, to, to these uh, rights and these uh, values in trying to counter that. So I think it's definitely playing a role, and I have uh, seen that by my own uh, experiences uh, and uh, we have found very uh, helpful and useful ways of bringing religious scholars, the religious leaders, to play a positive role in order to counter radicalism and those who are using uh, any religion. It's not only about my religion, but I have read and uh, heard from other countries also that they face with extremism, and I think that's why it becomes very important to, to tackle this issue. Thank you, Azala. Uh, Chris Seipel, who I suppose with the, the sort of glorious big titles of global engagement and face, it would be a bit odd if you missed the women out. But on the other hand, it's, uh, you know, what does it mean to you as a, well, I can't avoid saying it, as a man? Well, yes, I resemble that remark. <laughs> um, my name is Chris. I've had two jobs my whole life. Um, one, I was in the United States Marine Corps for almost 10 years. And then I've been with a, an NGO for the last 13. So I have a hard, soft power schizophrenia in my <laughs> mind when I think about these things. But in some ways, that's the defining characteristic of the 21st century, how you balance these things with an emphasis on soft. Uh, I work for a think and do tank. Uh, our whole premise is think before you do. I know that's uncharacteristic of um, your stereotype of Americans, but we're trying it out. 
<laughs> and uh, the, what our premise is is that religion, if it's been a part of the problem, it's got to be a part of the solution. That's simple. We all know it's been a part of the problem, and we'll probably talk about that later. But how does freedom of conscience and belief intersect with national security issues? So that takes me all throughout East Asia, Central Asia, Pakistan, and Banu, um, and to the MENA region, Middle East, uh, North Africa. Uh, I come at this from three angles, or three perspectives. One is I'm a person of faith, and I think a person of faith has a responsibility to be in regular dialogue with their holy scriptures, to be tuning in the radio station that is intermittent <laughs> and trying to listen a little bit clearly and say, what does it mean to live out the commands of the faith? I think that's very important, otherwise why believe? Uh, the second thing is I'm married to my hero. My wife has worked in government. Uh, she has worked in the financial sector. She's complete, she just took her doctoral oral and written exams. Uh, we didn't think we could have kids for seven years. We've had four. And we just found out we're having a fifth. <laughs> uh, she inspires me. Clearly. I don't know how she does it. <laughs> the last piece is this, though, to the interfaith part of the question, is um, I was in a recon uh, reconciliation dialogue between Christians and Muslims in Cyprus in the fall of 07. And the way they did it was they broke us out, and we were at tables of four. And I sat next to a woman from Syria, from Hama. And the whole thing that we talked about for, for one of the days was, what does it mean to submit to the will of God? Hmm. Fascinating. You can't be superficial about that kind of question. Islam is to submit to the will of God. That's one of the definitions besides peace. Hmm. And uh, she told me her story. Her name is Dr. Rufaida. And she went to the people in her town, to the mullahs in her town in Hamas, Syria, in 1992, and says, where does it say in Al-Quran Karim, the Holy Quran, that a woman can't have an all-women's college. And they couldn't point to anything. So she established the Al-Andalus Institute for Women's Studies, and we, have part we partnered with them before the Troubles uh, and did two conferences in 2008 and 2009. So I come at this with a humble perspective, allowing for the mystery and majesty of God, and also learning along the way from, from people around the world. Thank you, Chris. Um, let's turn to Kamit. Kamit, you, you deal with mammon uh, more directly than you deal with God, but you also are in a particular context in Israel where faiths do play a particular role. So what has this question meant to you? Thank you. Uh, I'm a labor economist by training, but I've been uh, dealing with public economic policy for many, many years. And... Uh, because in Israel we have two large minorities uh, that have very low engagement in the labor market. It's uh, ultra-Orthodox, particularly ultra-Orthodox men, and Arab women. Both have very uh, low participation in the labor market. Both communities are very poor, and bo both communities are growing relatively rapidly because they have large families. That's partly why they're poor low engagement in the labor market, large families means poverty. Uh, this is a major challenge from an economic standpoint and from a social standpoint, and it's something that we've been thinking quite a bit about and uh, trying to understand what is the cause for such low participation in the labor market, what is the cause for very low income even if they do participate in the labor market, and given the, uh, when we look forward and the, these uh, two groups will actually re represent half of the Israeli population in 35 years, it's something that we have to deal with today. And we're, be, we're thinking a lot in terms of uh, policy, economic policy and social policy of how to really get, uh, get these groups to uh, gainfully engage in the labor market. I would very much like to follow up that idea about sort of faith and practical economics as we go through the session and hear perhaps from the rest of the panel and, and from the floor, but that's a particularly uh, interesting example and it's, it, it's very good to have your, your expertise. Beth, Brooke, you get to go last and tell us what this has meant to you in your, your life and your work. Great, thank you. Um, well, I, I am a big believer in women and the economic potential of women 
women economically are represent an emerging market, and over the next decade, the impact that they will have as they come into the labor force uh, is estimated to be third in size behind the impact that China and India will have over the next decade. So it's an enormously important topic that women have to realize their ec full economic potential. My expertise is not religion. It, it is in the, in the core of business as a global head of public policy for EY. But we have 175,000 people in 150 countries. And fundamentally, our values believe in diversity and the value of diverse perspectives. And so we go far and wide to respect difference and value difference. And we, we don't, and, and part of those differences are religious beliefs. And, and that's an element that it, it's just an aspect of every one of our individuals. Um, and, and it comprises their identity. And we don't want that sort of when they join EY, we don't want those different perspectives checked at the door, just the opposite. We want everybody to bring them their full selves into the workplace because that's what makes them valuable. But what that means is that every day of our lives, those 175,000 people in those 150 countries, there's, there's an intersection between EY's culture and our value system and religious beliefs and a con country's culture and a country's value system. And so we work very hard to help our individuals throughout the world understand the difference between culture and cultural traditions and religious beliefs. And those can be, we think, different things. Uh, we want all of our employees to be able to realize their full potential. So we want them to realize cultural traditions, be respectful of them, dialogue around them so that our people know how to, to, to deal with them. But when a cultural tradition or perhaps a religious belief is actually limiting the potential of someone to to realize their full contributions and economic potential, mm -hmm. then we do we try to intersect our company culture in a way that helps them achieve their potential. Uh, I just want to be a bit unfair and put you straight on, on the, the spot there, which is I just can't resist doing when I hear you know lofty kind of corporate aspirations. <laughs> yeah, to make everybody to work across cultures, and this is something that you will have heard a lot of around the forum. But at what point then does corporate culture then allow you to be outspoken if you think that a, an operating environment is wrong or unfair to women? Well, I, you know, I will say I, I do a fair amount of that personally, uh, <laughs> of speaking out on behalf of the firm, as do, do our chairman, as do all of our leaders, where we think something's not quite right. Um, and we see that as, as both our obligation and responsibility to, to speak out. Um, I'll, I'll give you a specific example, yeah, please do. Um, not, not related to religion, um, but, but a specific example, a good one, I think. Uh, two months ago, I was asked to, to go to Japan to give a keynote speech uh, at the only uh, LGBT event, awards dinner, that would be held in, in Japan. And I agreed to do that. It, that's, that's an uncomfortable conversation in Japan, and it's mm -hmm. an uncomfortable a position for even our Japanese firm as, as the, yeah. the society is along its way in its journey. Um, it's, it's our obligation and, and somewhat my role as a global leader to be able to go in and have that kind of conversation um, in a way that can be, um, you know, just yeah. genuine, honest, and authentic. And uh, sometimes a difficult choice to make what you do and what you don't do. But yeah. the power of what we see, and this comes into in the area of religious beliefs, the power of role models who can, can just be present um, and be authentic and be yourselves in, enables and catalyzes a dialogue we find in a very different way sometimes and in a healthy way. Great, thank you very much. Uh, Archbishop, if I could come back to you. It's t taking the bull by the horns a bit here. It, it, that's not necessarily obvious to a lot of people that faiths have been the best friend of women down the ages. And if we look particularly at the situation and arguments that have been around in the Catholic Church, which seem to have somehow boiled up in the last few years, how can these things sit happily together, given that there is a sort of rights-based view of feminism in many quarters, but that is not the view that the church necessarily takes, whether it's on reproductive rights or indeed e equal opportunities. I, I wouldn't be able to take your job even if I were qualified. <laughs> <coughs> um, 
certainly, you know, they're, 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 what has changed in from my experience in Ireland uh, is the change in the status of women. Uh, talking about you know, the culture of a country, um, we have a, a very high percentage of women in the, in the labor force, um, much higher than in, in other European countries. Um, recently, a friend of mine runs an International Affairs Institute, and uh, Christine Legrand, who is the head of the IMF, is coming. And after our conference, there's a meal. So she said, I want to meet with only, uh, with only women. But she was surprised to find out that the Chief Justice, the head of the police, uh, the, the, um, the, the, uh, chief, the Attorney General of the country, are all women. Uh, and uh, you know, that in, in fact, that Irish Catholic culture mm. has also produced uh, a place in which women uh, have been educated and are welcome to take a place in society. Within the church, uh, there, there, there's a, there's a, it's a sort of a closed shop, or gives that impression. Now, I have, uh, in my own diocesan administration, more than half of the heads of office are women, and they're, they're the best. Uh, I mean, they've, they've, they've radically changed the way we look at the administration uh, questions and the, the way we look at, uh, um, for example, even in, in our charitable associations, a, a radically diff a di different viewpoint. But what, what we need to do, actually, is to change the attitudes of men, uh, that a, a culture in which men have been so dominant inevitably becomes uh, a certain pathology enters into it. Yes. And you know, many of the, these, these women, I, I have, you know, as my, as my, my, my uh, colleagues, co-workers, have actually had you know, nasty experiences, um, mainly through insensitivity. You know, that when, 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 when men get together, you know, I, 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 I don't like, uh, at times, gatherings when just priests come together. Uh, because it, it inevitably, a men's culture slips in, and a closed culture. Uh, and this is where I find um, uh, Pope Francis a, a great challenge. And uh, I, I was asked recently uh, to go to a cons rather conservative group and uh, to give a talk, and they said to me, uh, what's going to be your title? And they rang up my secretary, said, what's the title? And I said, maybe you should ask, maybe a good title for them would be, have you ever heard of Pope Francis? <laughs> uh, because you know, that he is, is somebody who's saying to this closed culture, uh, you have to open the doors, yes. not just to welcome people in, but to go out into the real world and to go out to the peripheries, which he constantly uses, uh, of society, and to engage with that. Now, we have to um, begin to engage with the culture of women in our country and with women leaders in our country and listen and be sensitive and, uh, and, and even though there will be certain things that I can't change, we can begin to change the culture. Um, but well, you say changing you can't a culture change of men is not things, e but easy. But let, let me just put, yeah. you, put you on the spot on your own views. Given that this is a faith which, you know, for the foreseeable future, isn't going to have women priests mm -hmm. at a parity with male priests, and the stance of the church historically on contraception, mm -hmm. uh, and perhaps more controversially on ab abortion, or depending which way around you, you look at it, do you have a, a kind of barrier to entry there, in a way, for a lot of women who simply feel that this does not relate very easily to the reality of their, their I, lives? I, I wouldn't be honest if uh, women don't come and say that to me every day. Uh, and um, as I say, this uh, survey, which was carried out uh, over the last few weeks in the Catholic Church in every country, I was watching the Archbishop of Vienna yesterday being interviewed on, on television, and 95% uh, you know, of those surveyed in Austria said they didn't agree with the church's teaching on contraception. Uh, um, a little lower, you know, didn't feel that women were part of the, uh, of the mm. church. Uh, this material will now come together, and um, you know, Pope Francis has said we have. It's one of the urgent questions we have to look at: is the question of women. But in if the he church. were taking your recommendation, what would he change first? Um, I, I think he'd have to. You know, the, the the first thing is we have to build or de de. Um, uh, to, to break down this culture of men. I mean, this is, this is, this is, uh, and, and to have, a, you know, and the only way you do that is by um, you know, frank and open, honest dialogue with, with women. Uh, uh, this probably, you could probably say it happened in the business world. Um, it did take time to do. Um, but I, I think in the, in, in the, the long term, uh, you have to, you know, certainly don't hide yourself in a world which is running away from reality. That's the first stage. L let's stay on the, the realities and some of the <coughs> harsher realities uh, uh, of the world uh, as it is at the moment on this subject. Uh, Zala, with 
with your both your own background in Afghanistan, but the work that you've tried to do there. How do you get anywhere when you're in a context of a resurgent fundamentalism? Doesn't even begin to accept the, even the basis of debates that we would be having uh, here in the hall today. What's the way into that? Well, uh, f first of all, just to uh, to continue with the uh, with the earlier discussions, I think we are when we look at the societies, uh, whether they are under circumstances as we are in Afghanistan and such such form of <coughs> excuse me religious uh, radicalism or fundamentalism. I think all societies are led by certain norms and rules and customs and traditions. And religion is playing a role. Uh, we, I mean, at the context that I am working, as I said, that like majority of Afghans are Muslims, almost 99% of the country, everyone is uh, practicing Muslim. Uh, now, you cannot ignore that part of the reality and just go and talk about different things. For example, rights to education, and to, well, you have to make sure to give references. But then there are practices in our societies, and I'm sure Afghanistan is not unique with this, that are, have nothing to do with religion, but still are huge problems, huge, huge, huge challenges that we are facing. And I think, the, I mean, beginning with the whole overall patriarchal system of uh, living, it uh, goes beyond the borders of just one country or countries in conflict. I mean, that system of mentality where men are not paid, like women are not paid equally like men, there are not facilities for women uh, to, to get access to job easily, there are not facilities for childcare, there are not facilities. These are challenges that, like everybody else, we also face in our societies. Our struggle living in that cer particular circumstances where extremism is quite powerful, and unfortunately, extremism is not grassroots or bottom up. It did not came up of the Afghanistan people and the, the way of their living. Uh, people in that part of the planet lived forever in that part of the planet. But the extremism is, is a product of conflicts that are related to the geopolitics, that are re related to the global political issues of uh, uh, rivalries between different forces, that one force favors one group over the other. And all these politics also plays a very important role in how they, they shape things. And then the problem is that they, it is always the weakest or the, the most uh, deprived part of the societies who are hurt mm -hmm. by these kind of rules. And indeed, in a patriarchal society, it's women who are hurt more than others. And in, 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 in when we were... Uh, deprived of our rights for uh, education, it was just because the ruling system did not tolerate uh, uh, the idea of providing such an equality or providing such an equal space for men and women to get education. And you know what's happening now? Now some of them, some of the kind of uh, uh, um, converted uh, Taliban or so-called moderate Taliban are now coming and trying to say, you know what, we are not against girls' education. Our own daughters are going back to school. And I said, well, as a human being who believes in change, I can agree that you have changed, but I cannot forget the fact that I was putting my own life at risk, and I know so many hundreds and thousands of girls and women were putting their own lives at risk to get education, a right that you were actually depriving us from. So extremism mm -hmm. is there, but the means to fight it or the means to counter it is always, uh, it has to be supported uh, through different networks, and it has to be more... Uh, uh, focusing on the structural and fundamental causes of these inequalities, like like you mentioned that the speaking mm -hmm. with men, it's it's not only uh, men. I uh, would like to say it, there are also, unfortunately, some women who also have this mentality that this is how we are created. Men are privileged more than women, so that's mm -hmm. the mentality that men and women have that needs to be changed for future. Thank you. I mean, Chris, you, you dwell on this fault line between geopolitics and faith, and I think try to productively use that and to forge links, but actually also to make things happen. I can't believe you'd only like to be doing it as a talking shop. Does, does it really get anywhere? It might be you know, at the back of our minds. Or is it just something that faith groups will, of course, want to, well, mo at least most of them want to show that they're open to dialogue? But do, would you tell me where you think it's actually made a difference? Yeah, that's a 
Well, there's a lot going on in this conversation. Uh, in some ways, what we're talking about is um, how does the best of faith defeat the worst of religion? And I use that in a security context, but it can be used in any kind of context where religion, and there's nothing wrong with these words. Please don't receive that in a, in a, in a negative fashion. I'm just trying to provoke the question. Religion being an, an ideological checklist that at some point might validate violence, for example, and faith where there's more mystery and awe, but still theologically orthodox, lowercase o, and you are not a bigot because you believe there's one way to heaven. That's what I mean by faith versus religion. Mm -hmm. So my way of, of addressing some of these issues, I think there's only one way, is you have to go back to your own holy scriptures, which is why I started out with that very point. On the issue of women, uh, you also have to reserve judgment and let people within their own faith listen to what they're saying in an exegetical sense and take the time to understand what they're saying. There are two sides I'm of the argument. I'm going to make you clarify exegetical. Sorry. For, for those of us who are just thinking, hang on, hang on a minute. Well, you've got, yeah, well, it's a good point. There has to be a theological uh, in, uh, introduction and analysis of the Holy Scriptures if you're taking your faith serious. So let me give you an example. Uh, I grew up from a conservative Christian background in America. Uh, things are assumed certain ways. But if I started thinking about the role of women, that means I've got to look at Ephesians 5. That means I've got to look at how the first church in Europe was set up by a businesswoman because there weren't enough men. Her name was Lydia. This takes place in Acts 16. And then there's Philippians 4 and how Paul addresses the leadership in that church who both were women. If you are uh, in the Islamic context, my, my friends who are Muslim who are women have told me, we look to the wife of the prophet hmm. who was a businesswoman who gave Muhammad his first job. And would definitely have been on a panel had she been available. <laughs> <laughs> but, but here's the point. You can say, hey, I don't care. This is my experience with Christianity or Islam or Buddhism. Whatever the case is, if those folks are having a theological, exegetical conversation, if there is some evolution of their thought and they believe themselves to be orthodox, then you have to find a way to work with them and listen to what they're saying. If you talk about it from a cultural or secular point of view, you will, you will most likely insult them and lose mm -hmm. them as a potential partner in whatever issue that you're trying to discuss. So these things are very, very real. So what's a practical point from the geopolitical? I was just in um, Central Asia going back last month and going back there next month, and we had a panel of all women. And the point is you have to make the decision to make sure you have a panel of all women in a very patriarchal society. Mm -hmm. And they were women scholars who were also, some of them were cultural, some of them were devout, devout Muslim by their own standards. I'm not judging them, this is what they have told me. But here's the takeaway from that panel. Domestic violence against women is so strong in Central Asia that you have the paradox of women fleeing the domestic violence and joining violent extremist groups to do violence against society. That's a peace and security issue. That's a geopolitical issue. And this is from women who are going into the prisons and interviewing women detainees and asking them what their thought process was. How do you engage that? You can't tell them about the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. You've got to engage them from Islamic theology. It's a whole different way of thinking about it, especially if you're coming at it from the perspective of government policy. A fascinating example there. Um, and very troubling. Karmic living as you do and working within an environment where you know, peace and security issues are very much you know, just part of, of, of daily life in Israel. And then your point about, well, you, you want to do something about those who are not active in the labor market and maybe not contributing, but that is very tied up with their faith, in the case of the Orthodox, and also the faith to an extent for the Arab population. How then do you go at the problem without just causing a pushback or a rejection? Get out, it's not your business. It's my belief. Well, I think that, uh, first of all, it's true that there are cultural issues, but there are also other, uh, other factors playing. For example, the reason for ultra-Orthodox men being so uh, poorly represented in the labor market relates to uh, the fact that for religious reasons, these uh, young men actually uh, get only uh, religious education between the ages 13 to 18. So even if uh, 
they would like to be uh, later on uh, getting into the labor market, they don't quite have the right skills. There are other issues related to the fact that actually they're exempt from military service, uh, only if they full, uh, they're full time, uh, they spend full time in the uh, religious uh, studies. So there are other uh, factors tied into it. I think that one of the main uh, or the key policies that we should advance is actually tying public funding for uh, education to some basic core curriculum uh, that would equip these people with the basic skills needed for the labor market. But uh, sorry, if I come back mm -hmm. to you and then say, as a, a senior member of the Orthodox community, I don't accept that because I want to educate in my way, my sons and my daughters, uh, you would then force a core curriculum? That, that's often <laughs> somewhat well, difficult. I, I, I think there should be some relationship between, uh, between the funding and the uh, provision of core curriculum because later on, as I mentioned, uh, families are very poor and basically it's the society who has to actually take uh, care of poverty. I mean, we, we do have a welfare system. By the way, I think that the welfare system uh, that was somewhat reduced also helped to start uh, actually uh, providing incentive to get into the labor market. I think it has to be strengthened, but there should also be uh, positive incentives in the form of actually, uh, for example, uh, earned income tax credit to complement uh, the uh, wages that are given the current level of skills quite low. So you have to provide positive incentives, but also some pushing. Archbishop, I mean, that's an interesting example of where the state would appear to be wanting to do one thing and faith groups are pushing back and saying, no, we actually want to do something else. And yet in other contexts, not least uh, sort of gay adoption and Catholicism, as we've seen it in the debate play out in, in Britain and Ireland, uh, you don't really like being told what to do by the politicians or not even, not even by the head of a central bank. So w what's the right balance between uh, state no and religion here? Uh, nobody, nobody likes to be told what to do. Uh, and uh, people don't like being to being told what to do by the church, mm. uh, which is, is a way in which, you know, how does the church present its, its teachings uh, in a way that is not seen as imposing on other people, but, uh, but as, as proposing and explaining. This is one of the things I think the church has been bad at in more recent times. It's simply mm. you know, put, thrown out its teachings and say you, you, you just take them. Um, I, I think um, um, one of the things that you were saying there today um, about closed education, uh, particularly with men, I'm very worried about the way that we train our priests. Uh, we train them very much in, in a closed way. And our, our younger priests are much more conservative than those who are middle-aged yeah. and older. Uh, a worrying, a worrying, uh, mm -hmm. uh, and much more, much more clerical, um, uh, much less open to dialogue, uh, much more convinced that they, I mean, priests will come to me and say, young priests will say, your generation ruined the church, we're here to save it. Uh, we have one saviour, and we don't need uh, some of the saviours of, of this kind. You know, the only way in which you break down a male-dominated culture is by exposing men to working with women as equals. Uh, and until that happens, then there... Now, I, it's very strange. It might seem strange to people. I first experienced that in the Vatican. Uh, I went into an office when in, fact, in which I was a priest, but there were very strong women there. Yeah, uh, and um, you know, I, I also may be fortunate... Not something that one particularly associates with yeah, the Vatican, yeah, but it's yeah, let a bit of yeah, light in for us. Yeah. So if we walk into <laughs> one of these, uh, you know, yeah. the sort of outer offices of the Vatican, yeah. you would find quite a lot but of But there was also, there, there was a good culture in that particular office. Other offices would not be the same. Mm. You know, I, I, I come from, uh, um, my, I have a picture of my grandmother in 1922 on a motorbike. Uh, <laughs> she was quite a strong woman. And my mother hated her because she was also a strong woman. Okay. They just did not get on with one another. Uh, and and you know, if, if you grow up in that sort of culture, yeah. Um, sure. you know, I, I, you, I, I, my, my mother, I remember saying to me, the first time I remember meeting my grandmother, uh, you're now going to meet one of the nastiest women you'll ever meet. <laughs> and, and, but the, what, really, she wasn't nasty, but she was very strong. And, and we came up from Dublin to this, to, to this lady who sort of looked us up and down. And, and, uh, <laughs> but you, if you don't have that, 
then you'll, you'll find yourself in a, you, and this is a big problem for the church overall. The church can make itself into a comfort zone for the like-minded. Uh, and again, this is what Pope Francis is saying. If that's what it is, then you've lost the church. You're not the church. The church has a message which it has to break out from its own closed doors uh, and go out and stand there um, you know, on your own two feet uh, and begin to, to, to accept criticism, to listen to criticism, and to change the way that... that, that, that. You know, I, I became Archbishop of Dublin uh, at a very difficult period when there was a major uh, scandal of child sexual abuse. And I had to face this on my own. You know, I, had, I had major... A, a, you know, a major investigations and at very times many of my other bishops you know, wrote public criticisms of me because I had to stand there and listen to the victims and to listen to their stories and to um, you know, at times you know, come away you know, almost traumatised myself yeah. from, from, the, from the burden of what I had to from the aggression of what I had to hear but if I had not listened to that aggression, uh, I wouldn't have been able to do what I have been trying to do. So th this idea of uh, you know, uh, uh, closed groups who decide themselves on what their level of privilege is, this is a big challenge that I have to face in the culture of the church. Uh, and the only way you do that is by, by listening to others. I mean, you know, on, 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 uh, you know, I have, uh, you know, in, in dealing with... with uh, uh, gay and lesbian people, transgender people. Uh, again, I, I listen to what they're saying, and and meet with them, and uh, you know, you know, feel with them. Um, but uh, you know, this is, isn't the tradition. This wasn't what I was trained to do, mm. uh, and and I have to do it. And um, I'm amazed at times at um, you know simple things. People come to me and say, you're, you know, you're, you're doing extraordinary things. You've got great courage. I haven't. You just, you just have to go out and do that. We have to, we have to change that culture in the church. Yeah. But it, it's very interesting. I was just, I just see Beth. You know, <laughs> I was wondering if it's a sort of, are you thinking what I'm thinking? If you've been in business and corporate life f for a while, there are just so many read crosses here. You know, people think of the church, maybe the Catholic Church at the moment, having very distinct problems, but the whole thing about closed cultures, a kind of pathology of male-centered organizations, which don't even really realize that they're male-centered because that's just normal as far as they're concerned. And I don't know if that reflects your experience. Uh, just as you talk, Archbishop, I can't help, the parallels are so striking. Um, and, and on so many levels, you are such an incredible role model yourself and to hear the story of your grandmother and your mother and how you were, how the, they role modeled for you, you know, obviously has had an enormous impact on your receptiveness to dialogue, your value for difference. I, it's just, you know, um, it's, it's, it's wonderful and, and you're the epitome of what this is. But the parallels between the journey business has gone through versus what the church is going through, I think, this, uh, you know, a, an incredibly domin male-dominated culture still is, obviously, in, in many countries, but in, in many companies, uh, there is a journey of change, uh, but it starts very much with dialogue. And I know even just speaking personally for EY to give you a glimpse as to how it, it sort of works, probably uh, 15, 20 years ago, very male-dominated leadership, and the women in the organization, there are lots of women around, in the, you know, like your Vatican office, there's lots of women around, they're just not at the top. Uh, so, you know, the women would, would get together, and we invited our all-male board to attend our women's conference. So you had, I don't know, at the time back in the day, you know, a couple hundred women and about 10 men. And it was the first time they'd ever been in a room mm -hmm. and felt like a minority. <laughs> and it had such a profound impact on them, just a profound impact. They would go to the restroom, and there were only 10 of them, and, you know, there were lines out the window. You know, it, it was just a complete <laughs> reversal of every image they'd ever seen in their lives. They heard the dialogue, to your point, a, a type of dialogue that they'd never heard before, just really discuss, discussing issues that heretofore were just not discussable. And, and that it just took that journey over time, sustained dialogue, sustained openness, a respect for difference. And over time, that is very much a journey that I think most, most 
most of the business world has been on and is still on and will be for a long time, but, it, but it's profound in its ability to, to change the dynamic and to um, help women reach their full potential. Uh, and it's, al it's also possible to go backwards. Uh, one has to be very, very careful. You can, you can move a few steps and think you're moving, and then suddenly this old thing digs in again. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that, that is true, and, and you know, it, it is why perhaps constituents are important, both in a good way and a bad way. Um, they can help keep the momentum going, yeah. or they can cause the ball to roll back down the hill. Right, that seems a very good point to uh, let you come in on the, the debate and ask some questions uh, for the panels. I'd like to take you know, I mean, you know, a couple or two or three at a time, just because gives us a nice range of subjects. I would say if you could make them short, as in haiku-like short, <laughs> because I think we do, you know, get the point, and we'd love to sort of have a, a flowing conversation. So, um, if you could think sort of brevity and sharpness and put them all on the spot, uh, that would be great. Now, who's going to kick us off? I think there are roving mics. Um, please put your hand up prominently because I'm very long sighted and barely <laughs> I see beyond the middle. Uh, there's a lady in the front here, and if you could introduce yourself when you ask a question. I am Sarah from Turkey. I just wonder, Mrs. Vlad, what is the percentage of number, uh, percentage of people? Uh, you mentioned ultra uh, orthodox people. What is the percentage uh, for their age mm. group, uh, if you just mentioned? That's a specific question, so why don't you just. Okay. Deal with that one. Uh, there are about 10% of the population. The ultra-Orthodox is about 10% of the entire population, and Arab Israelis are 20% of the population. These are the two min minorities that I discussed. So a big chunk right. taken together, yeah. almost a third. Um, right. Who else has got, got a, a question? Don't be shy. You got in, you fought your way past the security, you might as well use the chance. Thank you. <laughs> I will put my question in uh, German because I'm from Switzerland. Just a moment, just a moment. Be patient for a second. Okay. I have a question, first of all, to the Archbishop. When, eventually, will women in the world be entitled to determine themselves when they have children? In the Philippines, the Catholic Church is defending itself against the tuition in family planning. And if women are not allowed to determine themselves how many children they want to have, they're not really free. That is one of the <laughs> that's one of the big ones. Yeah. I, I am going to broaden it out to the rest of the panel because I, I don't want to just have people sort of feeling that they are only on the spot. But on this one, it does seem uh, a fair one to put straight to you. <laughs> I mean, the, the fundamental teaching of the Catholic Church is that uh, families, men and women, uh, have the right to determine the size, the number and size of their family uh, responsibly. Um, the, 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 the teaching of the Church on uh, on uh, contraception is something for it's an internal thing of the church um, and uh, uh, however fa the family planning methods are not the only factor that influence uh, the size of children the size of families um, education of women is probably the uh, most fundamental thing and if you educate women uh, they will then themselves uh, be capable and strong and will make their decisions on this uh, the question, the link between poverty and family size is a complicated one. People who are poor may have more children. Sometimes people have more children because they're poor. Uh, so that the, uh, the, 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 the broader area of um, the education of women is the key, and the education of women and, and, and of men, but particularly to provide women with basic education, basic understanding of health care are the things that... that really determine family size. Do you think there's been too strong a focus on the question of mechanical contraception, which I'm guessing was a bit in the background yeah. of the, the, the ladies? Um, it's basically, you know, why I mean, not? The, 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 the Pope, Pope Francis said that very, the, the church has become over preoccupied with these themes, uh, mm -hmm. a, a number of themes, uh, and with, with a, a moral teaching. And he said that, in, that doing that is actually damaging the moral teaching. The interesting thing, of course, is that uh, 
uh, if I go to an Irish television studio, they're the only questions I'll be asked. <laughs> Uh, which, which, which is a strange thing. You are, in fact, thing, an expert on contraception, strange, whether which, you like which it or is, not. Which, no? which is a strange... <laughs> str but in, in the long term, I believe that the, the, um, the, 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 the uh, Roman Catholic Church's work in educating women uh, to, be, be, to be themselves mm. is the biggest chain, the biggest way in which uh, you know, smaller families come when, when women are educated and the level of, of women's education uh, is stronger, and that I think is the most important way. Chris, awaiting your fifth child, <laughs> what is your view on this sort of linkage between family size, women's rights, con contraceptive rights? Obviously, you're looking at it across faiths, uh, not not only the, uh, the the Catholics who keep getting getting the question. How do you think about it? Well, thank you. Very little. Um, we're we're not Catholic. We're Protestant. Uh, we're Baptists. Um, I think about these, I think there's listening to the conversation because there's, it's good to have a conversation about specific issues. But there's this broader context, and I have, and I have not seen it exhibited here for sure, but I think within our society, and the question comes down to, to two things. One is, how do you love? And I think the definition of loving is, I need to love my neighbor in a language and logic that they understand. That's leadership, that's teaching. And that's what the Archbishop has demonstrated in his own archdiocese on these very difficult issues. And then the second piece is how do you educate? And you can say education is for all these different things, employment, empowerment, blah, blah, blah. I think education's purpose is to create good citizens. Citizens capable of mutual respect and mutual reliance. And if you can have that kind of culture without the undertones of, of, of this, that, and the other, and I recognize that there's real pain on a lot of these issues, then you can agree to disagree in a fundamentally polite way. Dr. Rufaida, whom I talked about from, uh, in Syria, she and I will never agree on the, per on the nature of the person of Christ. But that doesn't mean I love her any less. And so these are the ways that I think we have to think about the particular issues and, and show that kind of respect on, on, on all things. And I'll just leave it at that. Very, very, very interesting. Ozala, in the context of the Muslim world, how important do you think family size and trying to encourage a more controlled approach to family size is? Or do you find that it's just better really to go with the grain of where societies are at any given point? Well, uh, I think uh, when it comes to Muslim world, I think there, there are lots of similarities when it comes to, for example, family planning issues. And there has been challenges that I remember as a refugee, I lived in Pakistan and in Pakistan also lots of, it, it, first of all, it's a very family to family, community to community, and it's a very individual matter. Uh, in my own family, I have relatives who are very like um, receptive of family planning um, uh, or the, the ways to have smaller families uh, as opposed to larger families. And I have some relatives who have like uh, too many children and th their level of poverty is not related to how many children they have. I mean, they say, well, that's the, the general overall way that they look at the life is that, okay, the life is given by God. And then if, if you have a child, then there will be ways to like uh, bring them up. Uh, I think there are different ways, but uh, in very uh, specific way, different organizations, and uh, in, uh, at least in the Afghan uh, part that I remember working, uh, they are using different ways and different references from, again, uh, experiences of uh, Muslim countries trying to explain the importance of ensuring that you have a, a reasonable number of children so that you can bring them up as citizens who are responsible and who have enough to educate and empower themselves. So if you have, again, conservative forces, I mean, the conservative and radical forces are, I mean, let alone the issue of family planning, they are even like nowadays targeting directly the vaccinators, those who are mm -hmm. vaccinated. I mean, that's the, the, the challenge that we are dealing with. Is family size rising or falling in Afghanistan after these, this very extreme period in the country in the last decade or so? I think there is not a significant, uh, I mean, first of all, there are not very like reliable data, but in general, mm. there is not any sign to say that it is rising very dramatically. Mm. 
In general, uh, I mean, because we lost a lot of people during the war, like more than two, three million so far have been killed throughout the 30 years. If I personally look at the number of the people that we lost in our families and the number of children that they are, they are like three times more. But probably that will not, I mean, in an overall mm -hmm. way, there is not a very significant increase, uh, to, to, to speak of it. Let's take, I, oh, I'm I so sorry, do come in there. The, the, the discussion about education and, you know, relation to family size, I think, is, is, is right on and important. You know, it, the one thing that I would say, it's, it's necessary, but perhaps not sufficient. Um, that, you know, beyond education, then actually the economic empowerment of women, I think, is really important. And it does correlate to a decreased family size, actually, the more economically empowered you are. And I'll go back to Japan as an example. Japan has some of the most highly educated women as a population in the world. And they are some of the most least represented economically in the world. They, they participate least in the workforce, yet they're the most highly educated, which is why I've spent a lot of time in Japan trying to talk about how I really did believe women could save Japan economically because they're so well educated that if, if the society culturally would just get rid of the barriers that prevent them from participating in the workforce, that society's GDP could, could escalate so rapidly. So I do think economic empowerment, it has nothing to do with religion, but economic empowerment in addition to education is, is awfully important. Good points, well made. Uh, thank you. Let's take another round of questions if we could. Do we have any further back? Um, ladies with microphones, you can probably see question is better than I can. Do we have a couple there? Yes, thank you. Um, hello, I'm Lakshmi Mohan from India. And um, India is a country, we have so many different religions. We have uh, millions of Christians, Hindus, Muslims, Buddhists, and also Jainism um, living together. And this is beautiful in a way, but we do have many problems too. So what do you think the religious leaders or the government of India can do to empower women and most of all protect women? Because you've been reading in the newspapers um, about women in India lately. Thank you. Very good question on multi-faith societies. Should we just hold it and see if there's another one to add on to that? Yes, there's a lady at the back. Even I can see that part. <laughs> I'm Nancy Card. I'm from Quebec, Canada right now, originally from the United States. We're in a big uh, discussion over uh, secular or religious symbols in public uh, jobs, teachers, etc. That's a debate in other countries, France or Turkey or other places. There's been a conversation about is this a woman's issue or does it apply to the broader population? So I'd like to Are you thinking along the lines of the debate about head, head covering? Um, that, that is the biggest symbol yes. of it, and people will debate whether it is the symbol that is, is the focus or whether there's something deeper beyond that. Beyond that. Great, yes, very, very good questions. Now, uh, who, would, who would just like to take Yes, it seems right for Chris, that first question. Uh, the, the person to really, if you want to start to begin to think about all of these issues empirically and sociologically, the person's name is Brian Grimm. He is, he is the one who heads up, he's about to leave and start his own uh, NGO, but he's about to leave Pew Forum on Religion and Public Life that does the global surveys. And so he has found that where there is more religious freedom, more freedom of conscience or belief, there is a direct corollary, corollary with more economic development, more uh, women's empowerment, and uh, more political stability. And he just had a stat come out last week to the second question, which is uh, violence against women in these issues of headscarves has gone up fourfold from 2007 to 2012. And so those are the, but the larger issue again is, the, is those are symptoms of how a culture and a society wants to think about the other. And that's where the job of the state, I think, is to create that context without being politically correct to say we can have these conversations and agree to disagree politely, but then the faith leaders have to go and demonstrate that. So I was just in Myanmar a couple months ago and we were working with the majority faith there, uh, Buddhism, and there are some real issues within in Burma, and there, some Burmese are killing Buddhists, killing uh, Muslims in the Rohingya in Rakhine State. And so we had a, created a safe space to have that discussion with an influential monk. 
and the senior Muslim in Yangon, the capital of Myanmar, asked on the stage, help us, our people are being persecuted. And that monk, Sidagu Siado, took that man, Alhaz, and took him to Rakhine State and preached Buddhism. And said, this is not, the killing of Muslims is not what true Buddhism is. But what I'm getting at here is that the faith leaders of the majority culture have to stand up and say, this is what it looks like to love your neighbor in Christian speak. And to say, this is the very best of our faith, and we're going to speak against the worst of the religion when it validates violence against the other because they don't pray like we do. Can I just uh, Please, add yes, on, on the symbol part, uh, I wanted to, uh, uh, like the way that, uh, particularly uh, when it comes to scarf and the, uh, the way that, for example, Muslim uh, women are dressed. I always, uh, as an Afghan going around for conferences and for advocacy for women's rights, I've always fa faced by this question by many, many uh, w people around the world that, okay, uh, are women in Afghanistan are still wearing their burqas? Uh, and I always respond to this question uh, by saying that, well, actually, yes, I wear the burqa sometimes, and it's true, I wear the burqa sometimes. When I feel comfortable by wearing it, I make, I choose to wear it. So I think part of these uh, uh, symbols, uh, although they are always uh, portrayed as oppression or are, as something that is uh, something that women are forced to do it, but sometimes it is by choice. If if I see uh, a specific image of myself as my own choice, uh, I don't see any problem with that. But I, if I see uh, something that is forced on me. Like during the Taliban time, when the Taliban were forcing me to wear a very specific type of veil, the burqa, a blue uh, complete cover, I was protesting it. And I said, I am not accepting to wear that. And I would go around and talk against it because this is not my choice. As a woman, I am free to choose the way I dress. Uh, uh, so I think it's, it's to do more with, uh, with different uh, contexts and also with the choice of people uh, uh, but what I'm noticing now, I mean, on this part of the world, particularly in the UK or in other parts, uh, it becomes more as a question of identity and people who feel themselves uh, uh, a little bit, they are creating distances. I see more and woman, more mm. women who are covering, as I can say, a little bit more than usual in my eyes, at least. Mm. Uh, I feel uh, a little bit of fear and concern about that form of performances as a symbol because when I speak to my non-Muslim friends, they are always saying, especially male non-Muslim friends, they say that we feel very insecure to speak to women if they are dressed in that uh, very specific way because that creates uh, insecurity in terms of, oh, if I talk to this person, maybe I will offend in one way or another way. So the, the connection becomes, or the gap becomes quite wider. And I think every one of us have a responsibility to change that culture and to, to, to make it more uh, tolerant to everybody to, to live and to, to be respected. So there are, uh, and I definitely ag agree with Chris that there is a lot of responsibility over the leaders of different faiths to, to, uh, to raise the awareness of their followers or their uh, own communities on how to make sure to live in a tolerant and a society that everyone is e equally respected. Beth. And that is where I think business, yes. I couldn't agree more, and that's where business can really, I think, play a role, is having those uh, kinds of conversations and dialogue within the company confines that respect difference, teach tolerance, um, open the door to have the conversations that you described the men were uncomfortable having. Mm -hmm. In business, we, we, for, we try to force those conversations to happen at EY exactly. so that there is a discussion around the fact that the men is, un, is uncomfortable with that. Um, and so let's talk about it. Let's talk about what that means, your choice, just what you just described. That just goes so far to diffusing so many of these things that are, that are cultural traditions and mm -hmm. can be chosen, can be respected. And as long as they're not limiting the, the potential of an individual, then they need to be understood and embraced. But would you not see no, at least, tension in your business? If I came to you and said, I want to work for you, I'm well qualified, but I want to wear a burqa. I want to wear it all the time. Mm -hmm. You're in a client-facing environment. A lot of clients may not like it, and as Ozala herself said, might feel, they're just not quite sure what to make of it or feel slightly cut off. Mm -hmm. What do you then, as 
the senior practitioner advice. Then, then we, we talk about that, and we talk about it even with the client. We'll bring clients into those conversations. And, mm -hmm. and it's it very important. It's, it is just very important. Uh, the dialogue isn't just within our walls. It's we have an obligation and responsibility to build a better working world, which means we have to dialogue with those that we work with to help, help all of this. Mm -hmm. The other aspect, and that Chris mentioned about the faith leaders and the, the importance of their role, in our world, it's the importance of the CEO, the tone at the top. It's the importance of the Pope. I mean, you think of what the, just the, the, the you know, the Pope just saying, who am I to judge? Yes. You know, what, an Im what a profound impact that has had. Yes. Um, leadership matters, tone at the top matters, the faith leaders. It does make up. the mind turn to if he's CEO, who's chairman, doesn't it? Um, we've got, both of you would like to come in on, on this, I think. Don't, uh, I want to come in on, on yeah. what was said at the beginning. You know, we can, there are a lot of things we can dialogue about and must dialogue about. There are also certain bottom, bottom lines, and that is violence against women and rape. Uh, there's an obligation, an absolute obligation, on states to protect women. Mm -hmm. There should be no compromise on that. Mm -hmm. A state where the judicial system or the police system fails women in those circumstances is a failed state. And this has to be stressed uh, absolutely. Uh, uh, the other thing is, in, 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 uh, in uh, pluralist countries, Governments should be very careful not to favour one particular religion because there are votes or because they may get, you know, that they have to, you know, in a pluralist system, uh, the, 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 the state should keep away from favouring one religion or another, uh, especially uh, if they're, they, they, you know, they would be giving in to other, some sort of pressure in that line. But the first point I would really want to make is, uh, and it, I'm not talking about a failure of the government in India, I'm talking about a failure of our government in most countries uh, who um, can sometimes go, you know, things happen in police stations, things happen, uh, judges, you know, don't always give the decisions that they should be giving. Uh, th th this is, this, there's no discussion about this. This is an absolute. Thank you. It's always nice to have an absolute in this mm -hmm. debate. Carmit. I think regarding the question of empowerment of women, I think part of it is economic empowerment. And uh, as I mentioned, uh, Arab women in Israel have very low rates of uh, participation. Only 30% of them actually work compared to 70% in the rest of the population. And I think providing the adequate education, and there are actually studies that su suggest that there are specific attributes that uh, make women more likely to actually get into the labor market, access to computer, uh, more sort of uh, uh, an idea of about uh, more equality within the uh, household uh, and obviously adequate education. All of these are associated with much higher engagement in the labor market and I think that's a very important part of empowerment. We've talked a lot, at, uh, generally at the forum, about access to labour markets. Indeed, I think if there was a first commandment of Davos, it would say, thou shalt get women in, more women into the labour market. But do, do we, do anyone on the panel feel that perhaps we overdo this and that women, not all women, uh, want to be in the labour market, or at least not all their lives, and many women see other roles uh, for themselves? Chris? I don't think it can be overdone. It's the situation is, is too dire and too basic to who we are as humans. We have to continue to push on this. Uh, the women are more included in the, in the business world, but I heard earlier at Davos that only 10% are board members, and if you get into the Fortune 500, it goes to below 5%. Mm -hmm. The world that I work in is uh, the geopolitical realm. Uh, Ella Goldberg, uh, Alyssa Goldberg, who is the Canadian ambassador to Geneva here, she said of the 200 plus ambassadors in Geneva, 31 are women, 31. Of 585 peace treaties in the last two decades, 16% of uh, have addressed women issues. The United States has a national action plan for peace and security for women. There's not one mention of women of faith. I mean, there is a long way to go in different elements of the labor market, but especially in the geopolitical and the peace and security world. We need women speaking into that space bringing their beliefs and values into that safe space where there can be a dialogue. That's why we've created a center for of women of faith and leadership at our organization to, to look at these things and address that dire situation in the geopolitical realm. Great, any more questions out there? Oh, they say they're all coming thick and fast now. We'll take this one over here, this gentleman with the light blue jumper, and then I think we've got one here, the front. You take the light blue jumper and then the microphone. 
So yes, we'll take one at the back and then, but I would like to get this gentleman at the front. Yes. Hi, my name's Murray from Sydney, Australia. And I was just wondering what impact the panel thinks that a female American president will have on the empowerment of women, not only in the West, but worldwide. Thank you. I like the certainty of the will there. You obviously have powers of, of <laughs> foresight, which are <laughs> denied to the rest of us. Can we just hold that and get another one from the back, please? Did the microphone reach you? Yes, it did. Any divine intervention? Thank you. My name is Stefan Kleinsorger from Strasbourg, and I would like to ask the question, because we have the discussion in Germany about quotas mm -hmm. for top management levels. Um, my wife, who is a very strong character and very successful working for the Council of Europe, she always cites a sentence which goes, we only have true equality once we have mediocre women being able to reach the top as mediocre man can do now. Mm -hmm. Right, I wonder how that company would work out. <laughs> Uh, let's take, if we could just take one more, because we're beginning to run to the end of our time. They're both very good questions. Uh, the gentleman in the open neck red shirt gets a, a question and then to the panel. Hi, my name is Thomas Juli. I live in Germany, but I actually have lived in the US for quite a long time. Could now, I just ask for just a tiny bit of quiet in the audience? It's not long now. I feel like I'm the addressing the US before break. You mentioned it, uh, Mr. Seifel, advocates equality, gender, faith, etc. On the other side, if I look at the education system in the US, it seems that we're going backwards. For example, the discussion of creationism versus you know, teaching something about the evolution. So what's your view about it? And is this something we have to be worried about? This is also a question for Ms. Brooke. Thank you. Right, I think what I'm gonna do is just take the panel, going, starting with Chris and going all the way through, just pick and choose from any of those very good questions, Chris. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, there will be an American uh, woman who becomes president. Um, I think there's a good chance we can bet on her name at the moment. Um, and that's, the, that's what America needs, almost more than that, whatever your political opinions are. I happen to disagree with Hillary Clinton on many things, but she asked me to be on her federal advisory committee on the strategic dialogue with civil society. That's the kind of example that we need. Uh, and that's the kind of example that we need in our, our classrooms. The, I think the point is, whatever the issue is, is can we sit in the same safe space? Is it a space where we can put forth what our ideas are and feel vulnerable and say, you know what, I believe in creationism, I believe in this, or this on taxes, or this on immigration, and then come back and say, you know what, we're going to agree to disagree here, but we're not going to get violent about it. And that goes well, hang to... Hang on, isn't that fudging the question, which was about education? It wasn't just could you tolerate someone, as I understand. Is that fair view, sir? Not could you tolerate it, but what should you be teaching? Well, yeah, but the, the point is you can, you can teach on any of these issues and say these are the different perspectives that are out there. You can say that this is a scientific view. I don't think God and science can be in... My personal opinion is God and science can't be in conflict because God created science. But you can think about that theologically. In, in different ways, but my larger point is you have to allow for these different perspectives and then have the conversation. And like uh, the Archbishop said earlier, I think the role of education and government is to create a capacity to propose, not impose. And that's the key. And when you impose, whether it's majority on minority or vice versa, that's when the dialogue dies. And that's what we have in Washington right now, by the way. We can't even, there's no radical middle anymore between the left over left and the self-righteous right. We need, to, we need to reestablish that space on these key issues. And I think for me personally, it comes down to freedom of conscience or belief. And I'll stop with that. Yes, let's, let's move along for <laughs> the, the panel. Um, come at the quotas question, very interesting for us having you here. As I think in a, uh, there's a substantial minority of female central bankers, but it's, it's still a pretty small number. Do you warm to the uh, questioner's idea of using quotas to drive that on, or do you think, oof, no, I don't like the, the Q word? I think I wouldn't go that route. I think that the danger w would be if you actually get to uh, appoint people that are not uh, quite, uh, don't quite have the uh, proper uh, qualifications, it can be, it can backlash. So I think we, 
should be patient and gradual and move uh, in that direction rather than actually imposing uh, proper, uh, the possibility of people without the adequate uh, qualifications and then actually we would go backwards. I might bring Beth in on that in a second if I could, but could I, just as I said, I'd go this, yeah. this way. Uh, just please take on anyone you like. Um. In, in Ireland, uh, we had for 21 years, we had uh, two women presidents and children were beginning to say, why must the president be a woman and the Pope a man? Because they'd never <laughs> experienced anything. But it, it was very interesting, you know, Mary Robinson, Mary McAleese, two, two extraordinary women. Uh, the presidency in Ireland is a, uh, it's an office with no power. And these two women mm. changed that. Uh, for example, the president in Ireland can't make a speech without the approval of the government. But Mary Robinson said, said, it doesn't say I can't have my photograph taken with, for example, uh, gay, gay, gay rights people or, or other groups. Uh, you know, the, the photograph was enough to show that the most important thing about those two presidents was that neither of them, both of them came from outside the club. Uh, and if, if we need people who come from outside of the club of narrow politicians and um, who are able to, to change the overall culture in which things, uh, which, which things have, have said. And I believe that is one of the things uh, a good woman president mm -hmm. would do better than even a good man president from outside the club, although Pope Francis isn't doing a bad job. On, on the education, I, I don't want to, to, to feel that I brushed aside the question from the lady from the Philippines by saying that education is... If you educate people, you educate them to be free. And if you educate them to be free, they'd be free to like what you teach, they'd be free to like what you, uh, even uh, uh, like yourself, or dislike. The great thing about education is that you make people free. Mm. And uh, you, you, you bring them out of this closeness, uh, which uh, uh, you know, there are so many clubs around the world and so much club culture that real education is something that frees people to be themselves. And that is the way that things will change. Hold on. Uh, yeah, uh, just re regarding quotas, uh, I wanted to, uh, to, to mention that uh, in Afghanistan, in the post-Taliban context of 2000, uh, from 2001 on, uh, onwards, we, we did have kutas in Afghanistan. Uh, that was a situation where you had an absolute, uh, absolute absence of women from the entire political scene in the context at that very specific uh, time of the history. And then they, uh, it was decided that we should have kutas. But there is a very uh, thin line between looking at kutas as means versus looking at them as an end. Uh, kutas are only uh, a tactic, not a strategy, not a, a, the end goal. Uh, if they are looked at that way, it is useful because it opens an opportunity in a in society where discrimination is to its extreme to bring women up into certain positions. But if you look at them as an end, meaning that if you look at them as a situation where, okay, now that we have women and they occupy these seats at the parliament, then the story is over, women are politically represented, that's a big mistake. And this is what we are facing now in Afghanistan. We, have tw we had 25% kutas, we had 26% of the women in the parliament. Some actually won over the kutas uh, in their uh, provinces. What happens in terms of the parliament's effectiveness in terms of women's rights? Disaster. They didn't even manage the 26% women, female representatives in the parliament, they couldn't even manage to pass a law which is re related to uh, elimination of violence against women that we put. We have it only so far as a presidential decree. Why? Because these seats were not filled by women who were consciously there because they believed in women's rights, but they were basically rented or basically brought by the warlords, by powerful people for their own particular agendas. So it's very important to look at kutas, they are good as a starter in societies with very huge discrimination situation, but they has to be, uh, one has to be careful about it. An American uh, female president, I wish there are not only American female presidents, but there are female presidents more than male presidents uh, anywhere in the world. It will be great inspiration for all of us, uh, uh, but again, uh, I would like to uh, emphasize the point that the, the, the gender of the person on the lead is not the key or the, 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 the most important point. It's the person, him or herself. 
we, we did have lots of female presidents, and I can give you one example from my neighboring country, uh, when Taliban, with all their huge discriminative roles uh, and rules against women, when they came to power, our neighboring country, Pakistan, had Benazir Bhutto in power. She was the, uh, the prime minister at that time. And uh, she was, uh, her country was one of the first countries to recognize, and one of the last countries to recognize the Taliban as a, as a force, as a, as, a, as, a, as a government, sorry. So, I mean, it's not very important to only look at female and male, it's important to look at uh, people uh, in their capacities and in their commitments. Uh, Hillary Clinton has been a great supporter of women in Afghanistan, and her uh, uh, presidency or a presidency of any woman in a country like the United States will be very important and inspiration for, uh, inspirational for all of us. Beth. I, I agree entirely, and, it, and this goes a little bit to the gentleman's question in the back about the mediocre men and women. Um, your, your point, uh, you know, about the... We, we just don't talk enough about, or we, we focus so much on and worry so much about mediocre women fill, filling spots. Um, I'm not for quotas, but I'm not. Uh, I think the private sector and, and we, we can take matters into our own hand, but there's a lot of mediocre men in leadership positions. Um, and so I don't worry too much about mediocre women right now. Let's, let's have a few, let's just get some. Um, but having said that, I do think it would be enormously impactful if we had a, a woman president in the United States, but I couldn't agree more that we need more women presidents all over the world just as we need more women leaders. I see this in the business context. Just to give you an example, only 3% of the Fortune 500 CEOs are women. 3% of the Fortune 500 CEOs are women. When you think about their effectiveness, women lead differently. Um, and it's a very powerful thing, and it's a good thing. We need, we need men and women leading side by side because they lead very differently, and that's why it's necessary to have both of them in leadership positions. The problem with only having 3% of the, of the Fortune 500 CEOs as women is that they are such a minority force. A lot of CEOs, I mean, that's a, that's a club, if you will. They do business together. They interact together. They're here at Davos together. Don't you believe that the 3% feel just lonely as all get out? because there's just not enough of them. And so I'm a firm believer that we need more women CEOs, we need more women presidents, not to the exclusion of men, but to a point to where there's enough critical mass at around 30% to where they can interact and they have the networks and the relationships and it starts to work. When there's just an insufficient number, mm. those few women in those positions, I think, struggle to be as effective as they could be if there were more. Well, I mean, that might be seen as an argument for quotas, might it not? That the yeah. strongest argument for them, and I think Christine Lagarde said, once said something to the effect of, you don't like quotas, I don't like quotas, we have to have quotas. Mm. And I think her point was that you create, and I think Azala gave an example of where it was clearly a particular context where it could be manipulated right. very badly. But just, you know, if we're talking about Europe and America in business world, institutions, indeed in public sector as well, and politics, what's the problem really with saying we want to create a new normality here and we accept that we think the quota would get us there faster than the other incremental ways, which do, can, do seem to be taking up quite a large chunk of my life, really, by the time we get to a fairly low bit of the slope. I agree, and the, and the reason you see business to resist quotas is because if, if you're running a business unit and you've got in your pipeline of women to be promoted, you've got a certain number there that are coming through the pipeline, and if, uh, say, a 40% quota is put, slapped onto there as a goal, and you have to meet it two years later, you simply, it's not realistic. You can't get there, the, the, the pipelines. That's why business resists. It's more... They would, business would be in favor of reasonable targets, stretch targets to really push you um, to get more women qualified more rapidly, but an artificial mm. quota will, will end you up with You use some targets in your work environment. Very much use targets, yeah. absolutely. That's, that's critical. Okay, well, we're nearly out of time, but I'd love to squeeze in the last couple of questions. There's a hand at the back and a lady at the, the front. Of another. You, you all come at once at the end. It's like the sales. If you ask very brief questions, we might get them all in. Go on. Uh, thank you. Um, you mentioned before that uh, priests, young priests, are more conservative than uh, the old generation of priests. Mm -hmm. And in many parts of the world, we see increasing conservatism and increasing religious influence, or what one might even call uh, religious extremism. 
And so what's the role of religion in making sure that this type of conservatism is not hindering the furthering of women's rights? Okay, that's a very nice sort of wrapping up question. There was a, someone at the back, yes? Um, hello, my name is Sarah Schmidt. I'm from Switzerland. And um, we talked a lot about women and what women should do. And in Switzerland, women have a lot of opportunities to be well educated, to study. Um, but the problem is that when women want to start or have a family, they often have the choice of um, whether family or career. And my question is, what do you think about educate or teach men to take responsibility at home to do domestic work <laughs> <laughs> um, and <laughs> not only to be a breadwinner, but yes, do other work? I tell you, when you find that educator, can you send him around to my place? Uh, <laughs> Can, I think there's a last question. Whoever really put in a first claim, I think we have to take at this stage, because we have five minutes to hear from the panel. So last question, please, if you could make it short and very sweet. So hi, I'm Peter Niemann from um, Germany. I actually have two questions. We Ooh. talk about the education of women, um, um, especially the education of women of faith. But how about we go out and educate the men of faith? I think that's something that we always dis disregard. A second question is, um, we forget how powerful we Western <coughs> how powerful we Western countries are. We give all of these billions of dollars in, in economic aids. Why don't we just say at least six years of education of 90% of the women? Otherwise, we're going to cut the economic aid by 25%. Thank you. Okay. Yeah. Right. Let's go the other way around. This time to conclude. Beth, I, I'm all for it. Absolutely. Um, the the uh, good suggestions. The the what you suggest in the back about the it. it that's where the heart of public policy, I think, comes into play in your question about, about Switzerland in, in, the, in the family choice issues of that um, a lot of, some countries are considering paternity leave in addition to maternity leave. Uh, part of that is for economic reasons. Part of that is to change the social programming, to force sort of the, the husband to spend a period of time taking on the burden of care mm -hmm. so that they learn to do it and they understand the responsibility of it. Um, you know, paid child care. A lot of the public policy aspects can't address some of that. Um, last thing I would say that I should have said to the prior question was just that whole aspect of quotas and things. I don't know if you, you heard um, Prime Minister Abe speak last night or the, maybe the night before to the plenary uh, here in Davos, but he said he wanted 30% of women in leadership in Japan. Now, call that a quota or just call it aspirational, mm -hmm. I don't care, but it sure set a direction for the country. Uh, Ozana, last thought. Yeah, uh, related uh, to education, I think uh, it's uh, absolutely critical uh, to consider education for boys and girls, for men and women. Uh, we have experience of so many programs in Afghanistan supported by different institutions, government or non-governmental, focusing on raising awareness on women. And what they created was more violence against women. Why? Because women became more aware of their rights, but the perpetrators were more insecure because the women knew more about their rights, so there was a clash. So we are trying to really reconsider this whole uh, um, uh, interventions on different fields, social or awareness or legal uh, in all, to make sure that men are also educated. It also goes with the uh, women and men of the faith. Both needs to be educated in the way, and I definitely agree that education is what uh, makes a person free uh, to, to, to choose where. And extremism, and why, I, and I definitely agree, it was interesting for me to also hear that it's not only an issue with, with the Muslim world where we have younger, more extreme form of, uh, uh, people with more extreme form of ideas. Again, I think the only solution for it is education, uh, uh, that education which is more civil uh, form of education that makes people to have more broader, much broader beyond just particular precise strict religious education, but more scientific and broader education is the only way to stop extremism or to Ozana, uh, avoid I'm just it. going to bring you to close because I feel we just need to keep the time and move along the, the panels. Apologies for cutting you off, but Archbishop. Uh, my, answer to my answer to both questions is the same. Uh, I'm very worried about conservative trends uh, in, in younger priests. And I'm asking myself, you know, why? Uh, what are they looking for? Or more important, what are they fleeing from? Mm. They're fleeing into a comfort zone 
into their own little club, into their own clericalism, and there's so many others of these types of clubs that exist. Whereas the message of Jesus Christ, which the one they should be living and preaching, was to free people, to make them happy. That means reconciled and integrated themselves and fulfilled. And when I talked about my experience about victims of child sexual abuse, the thing that hurts me most is that those people will never be the men and women that God wanted them to be. That the damage that was done to them is so permanent. And um, we, we have to see, uh, to work out in a world where so many people are wounded, not to be just worrying about ourselves and our own groups. Got it. A word on education. I think that any public education system should include co core curriculum, whether it's for women or men, including math and science and English and so on and so forth. I think it's crucial for future uh, ability to actually uh, get into the labor market. Uh, regarding uh, women, uh, I think the issue of childcare provision by the state is very important, and also obviously changing the norms within the households. Uh, I change it in my household, I think. Everybody can. <laughs> ah, good. A quick example, what, what, what has changed in your household? Encourage us all. You and your husband takes on more of the domestic tasks. Well, we, you we have, have quite a, a good excuse of your job, haven't a, you? If a you, if very you equal division of labor, yes. yeah, and it started from the beginning. Yeah, well, <laughs> given that the entire Israeli economy depends on you being kind of able to work, <laughs> I suppose it, he might be persuaded. Uh, Chris, last word goes to yeah, you. Thanks so much, and thank you for everybody for being here. Um, you know, there's a saying that uh, marriage begins when you wake up one day and you realize the person next to you is not you. <laughs> We're talking about the human condition. It is the human condition to project ourselves onto other people and assume that they will look like and act like and vote like and pray like we do. Now, it's the responsibility of the people who have been in the power the most, the majority culture, the majority faith, men, to step outside that and say, okay, why doesn't she agree with me <laughs> in a marriage? It's, it, and to begin to empower and enable that kind of thinking and that kind of self-efficacy of confidence that they can do it and figure it out together. In our own, my own marriage, it takes two. You've got to be in constant communication with your first neighbor. When my wife went through her doctoral exams, I took off a month, became the global house spouse. <laughs> but, but you gotta have those conversations and figure out where the boundaries are and they'll shift according to where you're at in different points of your career, especially if you wanna have children. But have those conversations. Have that safe space in your home so you can have it in your community. And if you're living it there, then think about t having those conversations overseas. And the last thing that I would say is this. I would, want, would not want this conversation to alienate people who are making what we would call traditional choices. I'm very proud of my mother. She stayed home and raised three great kids. And that's a full-time job. If that's her choice, I'm going to honor it and respect it, and if other women come to that conclusion, or if men come to that conclusion, and I know families where men are the full-time stay-at-home person, I'm going to honor that family too. But the point is the safe space to have the honest discussion about the deepest differences, even irreconcilable political and theological differences about all of the issues that we face. That is what we have to figure out in the 21st century, gender issues at the, at the top of the list. Brought us to a roaring close there. Uh, well, thank you very much because I think this subject of faith, women in the interrelation between the two and the many spheres that arise from it are definitely here to stay. I hope we've cast some light. Particularly, I want you to thank our panel. Uh, I think have reacted with candor, spontaneity, flexibility, and all that one could wish for from a panel. And to you for coming and for your questions, which were very galvanizing. Thank you very much. Thank you.